Hello and welcome to What The Faux Travel Podcast with Nick and Amy. This is Series 4, Episode 5, and it's all about Panama. Hi guys, welcome along to another episode. Thank you for joining us. And yes, Panama, a country that I must admit before we went to, I had no idea what to expect. Is it like a very Latin country? Is it just the USA in Central America? Is it quite Caribbean? I had no idea. And actually, I was very pleasantly surprised. It's a little country with a lot to do and a big history. Yeah, it's got a massive backpacker scene. So I'm sure a lot of you, by the end of this episode, will want to go if you haven't already gone. Right, so on this episode, of course, we will have game show facts and we have language lessons with Amy. That's Panamanian Spanish because it's got a little bit of a twist we will be talking about panama city david uh, the lost and found hostel we'll be talking about bocas del toro and the, of course the panama canal which is so important we'll be giving you observations and our mark out of 10 for culture price and nature as well and of course how could we not do a panama episode without a game this month's game is called up the canal so let's update. Where are we now? We are currently sitting in San Cristobal de las Casas, which is in Mexico, Mexico. And we're currently sitting on the bottom <laughs> end of a bunk bed covered in blankets yeah, to kind of soundproof. It's actually a very good like makeshift studio. It just, and I, I know you can't see us, this is a podcast, but it just looks quite funny. But yeah, recording in a bunk bed, rock and roll. That's how we roll on What The Faux Travel Podcast. Anyway, let's get to our very quick shout outs today. Let's do it. Let's whip through these. But first, a special mention to Sean Dillaire, long-term listener of the show. He's doing something very cool. He founded an organization called Left Right Straight. And I think it's worth mentioning because they're a nonprofit organization that helps military veterans by improving their mental health through travel and adventures. They are about to go on their first, or maybe by now this has come out, maybe they've already done it, their first international trip to Ireland. So great work, Sean. I think it's a really good thing you're doing. If anyone, if that sounds like something you want to get involved with, get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with Sean. Lovely. Let's go. Okay, so first of all, the retired adventurer, he on uh, Instagram agrees with me on the wet wipe topic. Oh my goodness, so many of you got involved with this. So I can't believe the feedback. If you haven't already heard it, it's on our long-term episode, so I'd recommend going to listen to that. It's all about when you go to the toilet, cleaning yourself with some wet wipes. But we got a massive reaction about it. So, yeah, thanks, guys. It's amazing. And actually, it's not just me and the retired adventurer. There are loads of people who are like, yes, finally, I'm not the only one. But you should, yeah, we won't go into any more detail about it. But you should go back and listen if you haven't heard it. Yeah, our long-term travel episode, part two. We also got a lovely message on Instagram from Yasmin. She said her and her boyfriend have been listening to the show for about a year now, and this has inspired them. I'm sure not just us, but we've helped inspire them to do their own travels. They're about to go away for a year, and they leave Sydney very soon. As we record this, I think maybe like this day. So when this comes out, they will already be in Mexico, and that's where we are now. We'll see you there, Yasmin. We can be travel buddies. And also a shout out to Karim from Colombia and Where Goes Rose on Instagram. Yeah, thanks very much for getting in touch, guys. Now let's move on to game show facts about Panama. Amy, hit it. The Republic of Panama. The population is around 3 to 4 million people and the capital city is Panama City. Sartaleca City. <laughs> the, the major languages are Spanish and English. In 1502, Spanish explorer Rodrigo de Bastidas visits Panama, which was home to Cuna, Choco, Guayami and other indigenous people. In 1519, Panama becomes part of the Spanish Empire. In 1821, Panama becomes independent of Spain, but joins the Confederacy of Gran Colombia, which also comprises of Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. 
In the 1880s, France attempts to build a canal linking the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, but fails due to financial difficulties and the death of more than 20,000 workers from tropical diseases. In 1903, Panama becomes fully independent. The USA buys rights to build the Panama Canal and is given control of the Canal Zone. The canal is completed in 1914. In 1989, the USA invades and kicks out military leader Manuel Noriega. In 1999, Panama takes full control of the Panama Canal, ending nearly a century of American jurisdiction over one of the world's most strategic waterways. In 2016, the Panama Papers scandal lifted the lid on how the rich and powerful use tax havens to hide their wealth and reveal Panama itself as one of the most popular tax havens. This badly affects the Panama economy. Panama is the only place in the world where you can see the sun rise on the Pacific and set on the Atlantic Ocean. The Panama Canal generates one third of Panama's entire economy. Panama City is the only capital city that has a rainforest within its city limits. And finally, the Panama hat is not from Panama, it's from Ecuador. Very nice. Now, we definitely knew that one about the Panama hat because before going to Panama, we were in Ecuador and yeah, we learned that about the hat, didn't we? We did. But, you know, all them game show facts I just said, there's a lot squeezed in. Still loads more has happened in Panama, but for a little country, loads has happened. Yeah, big history. And also that's really amazing that you can see the sunrise on the Pacific and set on the Atlantic. Surely it's not the only country. Like, it's next door to Costa Rica and that's just as kind of thin, isn't it? Yeah, it's similar, but I believe there is a specific spot. There's like a mountain you can climb or a big volcano in the middle of Panama. And yeah, it's only from that point where you can see both oceans. And yeah, as, as far as I'm aware, the only country you can do that. That is incredible. Now let's move on to language lessons with Amy. Now, you may know that Panama's official language is Spanish, but it's quite an interesting mix of kind of Spanish and American English. So it's Spanglish, if you will. But they have some kind of weird words which they've mixed together. So, for example, if you're kind of on the road and you're telling someone, I want you to go on the right hand, I want you kind of to turn right, they don't say like derecha, like to the right. They would say araihan. So in their history, the Americans came over to build the canal so that, you know, they've got a big American population there. And so they picked up the language. So they were hearing them say on the right hand. So they said it in their Spanish accent, which was Arayhan. OK, good mix fusion there. Arayhan. And this kind of works all the way through their language. So in America, you have the quarter as a coin for money, but they call it cuada. Cuada, so that's like the Spanish version of it. And also, even down to girls, you wouldn't say like chica or niña, you'd say gyal, which means girl. It's kind of got like a Caribbean twist, doesn't it? Gyal. Yeah, and there'll be a lot more of that later at the end of the show when we go to a place called Bocas del Toro because it's very Caribbean. It's a whole nother world of language there, isn't it? Mm. So if you're thinking Panama is a Spanish country, Think again, because, yeah, you've got all the indigenous people there as well. It's a mix between Spanish and English. And then you've got this whole Caribbean language chucked in there as well. It is a really, for a small place, such a diverse and interesting country. Yeah, I was just about to say that. It's so small, but, you know, you can travel a few hours and be in a completely different place, as we did, moving from the Lost and Found Hostel, which we'll explain later, and then moving, I think it was like three hours to get to Bocas del Toro, which is a cluster of islands. And, yeah, like you said, it's very Caribbean it's just so weird we felt like we'd traveled 10 hours on a plane and we were in a completely different country but we went we were still in Panama and actually while we're talking about language I love the way that the locals say Panama because there's an accent over the last a of Panama so it's not Panama it's Panama like you have to accent the last part of it Panama so yeah there's a lot of American language mixed in with how they speak in Panama. But then again, in Bocas del Toro, they speak completely different languages, and we will go into that later. We've actually got a second language lessons in this episode. Whoa, packed full. To Amy, give us a bro, a brof. <laughs> Amy, give us a brief 
overview, bro, of our trip <laughs> around Panama. Yeah, okay. So we actually came in by boat because, you know, that's how we roll. Old school. <laughs> Only way to arrive in a new country. Oh, yeah. It was so cool. It was proper luxurious. Um, so we came through the San Blas Islands, or as the locals call them, Kuna Yala. Now that's going to have its own episode. It's going to be a mini episode because the San Blas Islands are a part of Panama, but they're autonomous. So they have their own laws and they kind of govern themselves. And they're just so unique that they deserve their own little episode. So I think that will be this month. Yeah, the next mini episode will be all about San Blas. So that's in two weeks time. So you're in for a treat then. But we came through San Blas Then we were transported to Panama City. So that's kind of where our main Panama trip started. We're in Panama City. We couch surfed there for a few days. Then we made our way to the Lost and Found Hostel, which was about a seven hour journey. But we stopped in David for a few days, which I wouldn't recommend as a a massive stop. But it was just a good way to break up the journey for a few days. We wanted to stop, relax, get some work done. And then we went to Lost and Found Hostel, which I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of. And if you haven't, you're in for a treat with that as well. And then we moved on to Bocas del Toro, which is very close to the Costa Rican border. Mouth of the bull. Yeah, that's what Bocas del Toro means. Well done, Nick. You're getting very good with your Spanish. Well cultured. All this year I've been in Spanish speaking countries, so I'm slowly getting there. (laughs) I'm on level two now in Duolingo. You're a boss. Big time. All right then, should we move on then? Well, move on, I mean, start. So Panama City was our first stop. And I must say, when we first arrived, it was like, yeah, we'd arrived in the USA, like a United States city, very big, like built up city. But we quickly learned, it's almost like two cities. You've got the area which is very built up, tall, high rise buildings. And then you've got the old part of the city. And it is such a big contrast from old and new. But we enjoyed our time there and we were couch surfing, which is always uh, a way to help improve the experience. We were couch surfing with Juan. But just first impressions and kind of what you then thought of Panama City, Amy. What do you think? Yeah, so we drove through, like I said, from the San Blas Islands. We came through as like a convoy of about four or five Jeeps with a whole San Blas tour and said goodbye to those, even though we were meeting up with them, some of them the next day for the Panama Canal. But yeah, we came in and the main road, kind of main artery of the city that takes you through, you're just met by these massive buildings. And like Nick said, it's like a US city. I imagine I haven't been to any US cities as an adult yet, so I'm not really too sure. But yeah, these massive skyscrapers, you can just see there's so much money there. So I'm not surprised at all that it's like a tax haven. (laughs) Um, Or was. (laughs) Or was, yeah. Not anymore because of the Panama Papers and the whole scandal that went on there. But it was, yeah, it just, it really shocked me. But then as we're driving through, we then went to a Bora area and then we kind of got to our hotel, which was I'd say in between, between rich and poor, actually. Yeah, that area, we weren't too sure about it because our first night in Panama City, we stayed in a hotel. Then we met Juan the next day. After four days on some tropical islands with not a proper shower, we thought it was probably a good idea to go to a hotel first before we met our couch surfing host. But yeah, we weren't even at this stage. Our first day there, we're not sure what to think. We've seen some really rich developed areas, some poor areas where we're staying a bit in between. We didn't know. And the embarrassing thing is not just for us, but the whole group of people After four days eating delicious, healthy local food on the islands, we were all craving like a McDonald's or a Burger (laughs) King. And you can get anything in Panama City like that because it is such a big developed city. Yeah, any brand you can think of, it's in Panama City. But can I just say, the one thing that I realized once I traveled Panama was that it was never really a country that I thought I wanted to go to. It wasn't, it didn't really have anything that I'd seen or researched that really well, I hadn't researched about it, but nothing to really draw me in. So it was such a pleasant surprise kind of traveling around and seeing all these different things that are there. Because I think a lot of people see Panama as a kind of way through either going towards South America or leaving South America. It's kind of your way through and it's like, okay, I can take off an extra country while we do it and that was definitely the approach I was taking to it and it was really interesting having conversations with so many travellers at Lost and Found because you know you're having your travel conversations and people were saying oh where are you travelling where are you travelling and we met this couple and they actually said 
yeah, we're not actually traveling through Panama. We're traveling Panama. <laughs> and what? And that, that just blew my mind. And like, I was like, do you know what? You've just made me realize how I've been perceiving this country. And I just thought it's such an incredible country. I don't know why I've been thinking like that. Yeah, very good point. But it is really like where at some point the whole world passes through Panama City. We've done it before a couple of years ago on a flight. It's a major airport hub. So flights from North to South America or even to Europe, they stop in Panama City. If you're on a cruise, you might go through the Panama Canal. So I do think at one point the whole world goes through Panama, but it's definitely worth a stop. So while we were there, as Nick said, we were couch surfing with a guy called Juan, who's an absolute legend. He is actually from Argentina himself, but he's lived in Panama for about 10, 11 years. And he just knows everything about their history. He's such an intelligent guy. And it was really great to spend time with him because we got to learn about the Panama Canal and the history behind it. We actually even watched a film together about it, which is on Netflix which shows five different perspectives in different times of the Panama Canal, which was really interesting. Now, I'm not sure if this will be on everybody's Netflix because it changes either country that you go to, but we're sitting in Mexico right now and it's on there. It's called Historias del Canal. So, you know, stories of the canal. And it was really interesting to see the different perspectives because there was like a love story in there and then it moved years later and then it was a story about this kid who... Oh, this doesn't sound very good, but he was like going down this hill when it was this big thing. <laughs> but uh, actually, is people now act it out in real life? Yeah, they go to this particular building where there's a hill, and they like go down it on like cardboard boxes, like they surf down this hill. Or something yeah, like it's a bit of a tourist attraction, but yeah, I would recommend watching that if you want to understand the history. There was also the true story of how a group of Panamanian students they were protesting against the Americans because yeah, all of the land along the Panama Canal was the USA. So if you were born in this land, even though it's in Panama, you you're American, you're from the USA. And the local Panamanians didn't like that and they couldn't put their own flag up in their own country. And you know how these things develop, similar stories around the world where stuff like this happens. And there was a protest and it got violent and yeah, quite a few Panamanian students got killed. So there's a lot more behind the canal than meets the eye. And yeah, it was interesting. It opened our mind. We didn't really know anything about the canal. We knew it was just a way you can connect two oceans and it's an amazing engineering feat you know, literally cutting through a whole country and splitting a continent into two. But it's affected the lives of so many people, good, you know, good and bad, and it's brought a lot of people to Panama, people who are originally working on the canal, people that still work on the canal. So, yeah, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. I don't think we've actually explained why it's so important. I know you just said it splits the kind of two countries in half, but all the cargo that needed to get to different countries. So basically, say there was a cargo ship coming from the UK and it wanted to go to Chile yep. for example if you think about it on a map they would have to travel all the way down to Patagonia and travel around South America but now there's this canal they just have to sail down to Panama cut through and then end up on the other side of the ocean so it really does save millions if not billions of money you know and yeah it's like you said we're not kind of geeky over boats or anything like that but <laughs> it is incredible what they did so we're going to hear from Juan our couch surfing host and then we're going to come back and we're going to tell you what it's like to visit the Panama Canal today and maybe how you can see it for free well that's what <laughs> I was going to because <laughs> we didn't pay to go in and we'll give you a little travel tip here but yeah, let's talk to Juan first. So one thing I really wanted to ask Juan, this might sound strange, but my question was, who are Panamanian people? And by that, I mean, are they descendants from Europe, you know, Hispanic? Are they native people? Are they African, Caribbean? Who are Panamanians? In Panama, you can find a lot of different culture. Their origins are from native Indian people, from different areas. Unayala, Nove Bugle, there are seven different areas. And you have, yes, people from Africa, from the Antilles, from Jamaica, from United States, and from Europe too. So there is a mix of cultures here. And why is there such a big mix of cultures? I think it's because of the canal. First, for the construction, then for the occupation of United States and the last wave, the recovering for Panama of the canal. Speaking about the canal, 
I know like the whole world benefits from it because it improves the shipping routes, but Panama, the country, has Panama benefited from the canal? I don't know which is better. I think it's different, different from another near countries and its own culture. Panama wins a lot of things with the canal, a lot of things. So I think, yes, they are all benefits from culture, music, engineering, laws, everything. I think Panama is, is a very different country than other near countries because of the canal. Do you think there is a big difference, a big gap between rich and poor people here in Panama City? Yes, you can see a big, big difference here. I think it's big contrast here. I think you have the poor or rich people in every city in the world, but here you have a short difference. Some people make big business, but it's, it's a small country. There is only a few people, so if you look at the rest of the country, you can see a... I, don't, I can see poor people, but uh, working people. Working Most class. of the country are working class, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. How has Panama City changed after the Panama Papers? Oof, the change was big because the economy was growing like 10, 11% every year big growing you cannot see these numbers i don't know maybe china big big numbers a few years ago but now it's about five percent it's a good number for a country very good number but because of our last question the grow you can see in logistic in, in some business that create reach for some people but not for everybody The people here are used to work on construction and after Panama Papers, the construction goes down, I think, 50% than it was a few years ago. So, yes, it was a big difference after that. And here in Panama City, there's lots of big, tall buildings of flats, but there's no lights. Yes, it's a visual comprobation of the situation. There's a lot of people buy apartments to rent or to resell, but this thing stops the economy. So you can see a lot of apartments are sold, but you're nothing there. No one's living there. Uh, you yourself, you're from Argentina, so you're not from here, but you've lived here for 12 years. 12 years. So do you like living here in this city and in this country? Yes, I like living here. I think it's beautiful country. It's, it's a small country, so you can go to very different places in only a few hours. Uh, you have beaches, you have mountains, you have the best coffee in the world. You have the canal that is beautiful. Panama have a very beautiful story of the creation as a country. They have an invasion then from North America. They have a lot of good stories. And you can see buildings from 500 years ago and new buildings. You have a lot of things to do here. I think it's a nice place to live. It's, I think, in Latin America, it's one of the safest city. You can walk without thinking if or seeing everywhere. I think it's a nice city to live, yes. Should we talk about the canal a little bit more? We've already spoken about it a bit, but it's, it's such a big deal. Everyone bloody loves the canal there, Juan. Juan couldn't get enough of the canal, oh, could he? We, we just seem obsessed, don't we? So, <laughs> like, for the whole start of this episode, that's all we've been talking about. Right, so, we actually went to see the canal for free, but that's because... So, when you go, the tickets are actually about 20 US dollars, and actually, that's something to say, that their currency is US dollars. Yeah. So, yeah, everything's quite easy to exchange in your head. So, 20 US dollars to go to the canal, and that gives you access to the museum where you can see all the history, and then you can also go up to the viewing platform, 
and you can actually see the water and the boats, how it goes through, because it's hard to explain <laughs> with audio rather than showing you, but the boats arrive and then the water comes out of the canal and then it lowers the boat so it can get onto the next ocean or sea. Yeah, it's like a lock, isn't it? When the yeah, water, lock. The water goes up and down, yeah. Yeah, so you can watch that all happening. And I think if you go around midday, you can actually see that happening. And then other times of the day, you just see the boats going through we were very shocked at the price of twenty dollars i know that includes the museum but i just feel like that was a very high price for what it was i was doing a lot of research you know how can we do this for free because before we'd gone we didn't really know what it was it's such a big part of their history so we wanted to go but now i've been I wouldn't actually recommend it unless you're into ships and boats and that's your thing and this is just like mind-blowing to you, you're an engineer, then go, understandably. But if you're just the average Joe like us and it's not really that interesting to you, I wouldn't recommend going. Yeah, because when you get there, there's not really anything to see. (laughs) It's just some ships passing by. But yeah, the whole, it is an amazing engineering feat and it's interesting to learn about, but there's not really much to see. Is no. That? So, yeah, you've got the museum, but we didn't go into the museum, so we can't really comment on that, but we've heard it's really good. But that's from people that are really interested in it. I did a lot of research, basically, to see how we didn't have to pay this $20 because we're living on a very cheap budget. Yeah, 20 you know, each. 20 each. That's $40. Anyway, I found that you can go to the Canal restaurant for free. They, you walk in and you get a wristband saying that you're going to the restaurant and that's free. You go up and then you can buy the buffet and you're sitting in basically the viewing platform and you can see out while you eat your meal, which sounds great. And I've heard the buffet there is really good food. Um, maybe the, the evening food is kind of overpriced, I read. But again, once we arrived, we found out that the lunch was $30 for a buffet lunch. What? $30 each. And so I know that includes the $20 of what you're doing, but we just couldn't afford that. So we'd got there. We were up at the viewing platform because we were going into the restaurant so we could see everything. But then we didn't actually go into the restaurant because it was just too expensive. So we left, but we effectively saw everything that you can see. Yeah, I went to the viewing platform, took a quick picture. Yes, like you said, we couldn't go in the museum, but good thing we're staying with Juan, who knows everything about the canal. He is a museum. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you just go up to the restaurant. We saw the view. Then we realised the restaurant's really expensive, and we left. Panama Canal, done. Done. Yeah, and again, just so you can work out your currency and kind of price to do that for the day, you can do tours, or you can get an Uber for five pounds or so. You know, six, seven US dollars from the main part of the city to the Panama Canal because this is just a bit out and again so we didn't do it completely for free I guess we still paid that but I wouldn't recommend it and I don't normally say that on the podcast but I really really would and it's unless it's something that you think you would be interested in I would say don't go stay at home and watch the Netflix film even the Netflix film like it was interesting if I'm being 100% honest it wasn't like the best film as in terms of like budget and acting and it, it did it looked a bit budget but still what you learn and the history is very interesting so i'm glad we saw it well i don't know i was entertained by the acting <laughs> <laughs> well exactly you entertained at times when you probably shouldn't be entertained yeah entertained for the wrong reasons but it was still good if you want to know the history go for it right and finally let's move on. yeah let, we will move on but i should say it's the mira flores tourist like visitor center that's the best place to see the canal But I'm sure there are some secret places further up. If you've got your own car, you can probably see it for free there. But anyway, yeah, let's move on. We're leaving Panama City. I did enjoy our time there. It's not the most amazing place I've ever been to before. Seeing the contrast is interesting. But like two days there, I think you'd be fine. Yeah, that's absolutely enough. You can do the Panama Canal, walk around the historic center, uh, eat some good food, and you're pretty much done. Great. Moving on, we went deep into david (laughs) david he loved it (laughs) so yeah we got a bus from panama city to this town called david but that's because from david it's easy to get to the lost and found hostel and we just had a couple of days like amy said earlier to do some work we didn't even see the town center of david did we no we were just doing our work but do you know what's mental is that we are going to talk to you about uh, lost and found hostel but I couldn't tell you where in Panama that is. <laughs> I mean, I could point it out on a map, but I don't know what the... Because it's not in a town or anything. This hostel is amazing. It's like in its own 
kind of land. That's part of the mystery and the charm of it. Where is it? Pff, don't know, mate. You know, <laughs> it's somewhere in the mountains in the uh, in the forest. But it's almost like everybody knows this area as called, you know, Lost and Found Hostel. Everybody knows where you mean when you're there. Like, oh, I'm going Lost and Found. Oh, okay, yeah. It's, it's just the same as going, you know, I'm going to Panama City. And people understand what you mean. People know, man. Everyone around the world knows. The reason why we knew about it is because all you guys got in touch and said, you must go to this place. But we're going to get into it. First, we have our game. And I'm particularly excited about this one. Oh, is that one. now? Okay. It, it's now, Amy. It's come now. And we said we weren't going to talk about the canal anymore. Oh, God. This is an episode all about the canal, isn't it? It's kind of loosely based around the canal. The game is called Up the Canal. Okay. Lols. I bloody love it. And what is going to happen is <laughs> I have found some of the best online sexual innuendos, you know, like live on TV that are not supposed to be rude, but they sound very rude. And I'm going to play these to Amy. I've got five of them. And the idea is for her not to laugh. OK, if she laughs, she loses. If she no, sorry, if she laughs, I, I win. She loses. But if she doesn't laugh, that means she wins. So I need to make her laugh. Now, she's also going to have water in her mouth, which she needs to hold in. Might sound similar to a popular radio show in England, <laughs> but they didn't invent innuendos. And I'm not claiming that we invented this game. Did they invent water? I don't think so. Exactly. It's going to be fun to play and it's going to be fun for you guys to listen. But my first question before we get started is, Amy, have you ever been taken up the canal? Um, it depends in what context you're asking me that question. <laughs> Who would you let take you up the canal? Uh, me or like, anyone? Are we going to be on a boat? Yeah, talking about the Panama Canal. Yeah, yeah. So you've uh, never been up it? I'd let a captain take me up the canal because I wouldn't trust you because you don't know what you're doing. That's very, very <laughs> true. Wow, that is, okay, that's an insight. So let's get started, shall we? Do you know what? This was the first episode, uh, like right before when we were planning and prepping to start recording. It was the first time I had to say, have we got something for me to spit into? I need a spit in bucket. There we go. Always necessary. Okay, what we're going to do is, Amy, I'm going to hand you some water soon. Please take a mouthful and I will provide you with a spitting bucket right next to you, okay? Okay. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Clip number one from everyone's favourite daytime TV show this morning. Oh, come on, oh, you God. shut your eyes and do it. <laughs> this is lovely. Oh, don't oh, look at it. Don't, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Go. See, it's all right when you... When you... Once it's in, I love it. But I... Nice, you <laughs> see? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's held the water in. Oh, well, she's laughing, but you've done it. Well done. You've passed the first one. You can swallow. Oh, I prefer <laughs> to swallow than spit. You like those guys, don't you? They do some good oh, innuendos. I love that show. They're so... Well, I don't love it because I don't watch it. <laughs> but I, lo- I always watch it. If social media brings up a innuendo video, I love it. All right, are you ready for clip number two? Right, wait, let me get my water. Okay, take a big mouthful. <laughs> There's a big one. All right, clip number two. Looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger is getting a bit of a reputation. Arnold Schwarzenegger had a number of liaisons with women at his Santa Monica complex. Some of those women apparently came a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a spit. <laughs> Some of those women apparently came a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You might as well swallow it or spit it all out. I saw it. That was a spit. I don't understand in what other context was he trying to say that. I know. They came more than, some of them came more than once. Oh, like they, they visited are, yeah, it. Exactly. Right, okay. What else do you think he meant? God, Amy. All right, so basically it's 1-1 one, one at the moment. Okay. Drink of water, please. Before we play this clip, Amy, do you think size matters at all? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, here we go. One for you cricket fans. And England skipper Andrew Strauss arrived in London proudly showing off the little urn. They'll spend four days at home before flying out for the World Cup. And Belinda, I just can't understand how something so small can be so impressive. Well, Mark, you would know about that. <laughs> no? no, no, no. You've done well with a little chuckle, but you didn't spit. Well done. 2-1 to you. Drink of water, please. Get ready for clip number four. OK, well done. Here we go. Right, now... This one is about, uh, it's a little handheld exercise machine, okay? Mm-hmm. Here we go. What could be funny about that? Then, Ali, is it better to go slow yeah. or better to go fast? 
Just a um, question. I think you you kind of vary it. Uh, you vary it. You yeah. can know how you're you're doing, you know, by feeling. Yeah, I've got course. a small white one. Weird. Does that make a difference? <laughs> uh, no, actually, you know what? I don't think I don't actually think it's the size of it. It's uh, actually the technique and how you. Okay, okay thank you. Oh, yeah, gosh. yeah. But thank you so much for asking that. I'm no, sure a yeah. lot of, of men at home were wondering that as well. Not Chris, because he no. he told me he had the big black one. <laughs> Ah, uh, she's laughing, but she's held it in. She's done very well. All right, you can swallow. Wow, it's three. I don't know. If I'm honest, there were a few drips. What What if you have a few it's drips? It's dripping down your chin right now. Yeah, you got to keep the water you in your mouth. you me now? you got to keep the water in your mouth. So I think. Yeah, but a, a few drips came out. Yeah, exactly. That... You've got to keep it in your mouth. So that okay. means you lose that one. That means it's 2-2. Two, two. That means the next one is can the I decider. Can I just say, no, wait. The thing that made me laugh the most there was that noise in yeah. the background. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was getting me going. And he told me he had the big black one. All right then, another mouthful of water, please. Are you ready for the deciding innuendo clip? Here we go, back to Amy's favorite TV couple. I know we haven't got time to do it now, but can you just stay and do me? Oh, <laughs> that sounds... Uh, I can see the water coming out. Again, again, so uh, absolutely. <laughs> that was it, I saw water come out. Mm -mm. I saw a loads drip mm -mm. out. You're done. Mm -mm. You're done. I know we haven't got time to do it now, but can you just stay and do me? <laughs> that sounds uh, <laughs> like an offer I'm going to get again. So, Why is she uh, saying absolutely. that? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know what they were talking about. That's it, you lost. Three times water came out of your mouth. I'm keeping score. Three times water came out, two times it didn't. So that means you lose, but it, again, it doesn't. none of these games you play matter. They're purely for entertainment value. Okay. Did you like? I those think innuendos? I won, but whatevs. Um, they were all right. Yeah, but nothing amazing. Not really. No. I feel like whenever we do a game like this, you're like, "Come on, then, make me laugh." And it's like you. It would take something extra, extra. I special. don't know because I wouldn't call those innuendos. I would say they're like like that one with the the exercise hand machine. Yeah. They knew what they were saying, so they're not innuendos. All right. Let's move on from that filth. And let's start talking about the Lost and Found Hostel. As you guys probably know, we don't normally go into uh, details of hostels, but this one is a special one. And as soon as we said we were going on like Instagram and Facebook, we got so many messages from you saying like, oh, I'm so jealous you're going there. That's my favourite hostel in the world. And yeah, a lot of you love it. So if you don't already know about it, we want to let you know and kind of pass on the act of kindness. Yeah, now this is a real... Special different hostel because, yeah, it's in a remote location. You have to get, a, well, in our case, we got a little Collectivo bus, like a little minivan from David, and it was going to Bocas del Toro. But you tell them, I'm going to the Lost and Found hostel, and they all know, all the bus companies know, and they're driving for like a, an hour or two, and then suddenly they stop in, like, in the hills, in the mountains, and they say, right, you get out. At first you think you're in the middle of nowhere. And then you see a sign for it and you have to walk. You have to walk up. It's only like 20 minutes, but with your big bags, you know, it can be a bit of a, a challenge or an effort to get there, but that's what makes it so special. And that is the only way up there. You can't drive, you know, you can't boat. You can't do anything else, no cable car or anything. You have to earn it. You have to trek to get there. And it's in a pretty spectacular location. Like the views are next level. Yeah, so once you've done your hike up there, there's a few different viewpoints around the hostel. Uh, one, especially where you can go up some stairs. And it's just beautiful. It's so high up, it has its own microclimate. So down the bottom where you kind of get dropped off, well, not where you get dropped off, even further down where you start your journey, Panama is hot. Yeah, you go all the way up there and it's cool, you know, like in the evenings you need a jacket, which was such a nice little break from where we'd just been, you know, yeah. we'd been on all the islands, too much sun, a bit sunburnt, so it was perfect. But yeah, it has its own little microclimate, which makes it different again. But what's different about this and our next interview is going to explain this in detail, but they have so many different free activities that you can do. You know, there's treasure hunts and which are a bit like um, escape rooms, but you do it around the hostel. There's jungle treks. You can go to, um, what's the, is it a canyon? What's it called? Yeah, you can go to a water canyon. And actually we did some yoga classes down there, but you can also do yoga classes 
at the hostel there's just so much to do you can easily spend a week there and not get bored and you're in the middle of nowhere so you know there's plenty to do they actually say you should really stay a minimum of three to four nights and I completely agree with that because it's a little bit of a journey to get there and then to get on to your next place so you want to enjoy it I, I remember when we were there some people came for one night and I just thought that like you haven't done it any justice you don't you shouldn't do that and to encourage you to stay the extra day they actually do a thing where if you stay for three nights you get your fourth night for free which is incredible I don't think I've ever seen that with a hostel before that's a really good yeah really good point it's a good deal but they put the effort into keeping you entertained because it is in the middle of nowhere most hostels you stay in them because the location is convenient because it's close to everything so you can walk everywhere this is the complete opposite but like you were saying amy they really go the extra mile to make sure you're entertained when you're there as a good bar it's kind of it's not a party hostel but it kind of it does turn into a bit of one but the bar's quite far away from the rest of it so you can also have peace and quiet and yeah the facilities there are very impressive and what struck me when we were there was the diverse type of travelers so you know you had couples like us you had your more kind of hippie travelers there you had your party travelers there you know people who are just on a quick trip people who are on a long trip it was such a nice mix and older people younger people every mix you could think of that's what lost and found was which is a massive breath of fresh air because you know you kind of get into a rut with hostels don't you if you're traveling for a long time anyway and you get into a rut of meeting the same type of people because you're booking the same type of hostels and and all of that so yeah that was really nice yeah and what creates we actually say we hate it when people say oh the hostel felt like a family you were like come on but actually this was because you're kind of forced to do all these activities together and if you want to pay for food there they serve dinner at the same time to everyone so you'll, oh, I loved that. you'll sit together for dinner it's a really nice time of the day where you sit together chat about whatever and it does feel like a family as well as the activities oh sunsets are amazing there we put some stories and pictures up on instagram so it does create this nice group of people you feel like actually you feel like you're on a tour you're traveling yes you feel like you're traveling with a tour and we all know what it's like when you're on a group tour by the end of it it does feel like a bit of a family yeah where you've kind of spent two or three days with like that bunch of people but you feel like you've known them all your life it was one of those anyway let's get to our interview and this is with Andy so there's two guys that own this and Andy is one of them and he explained to us how the hostel actually got started from like childhood I being a teenager I just wanted to venture you know and like I worked a bunch of different jobs in different places and lived overseas I finished high school in Kenya and East Africa and studied biology and environmental science and uh, I worked every job from being like a karaoke lounge singer in Japan to like uh, being a sport fishing guy to planting trees to being an English teacher and when I was in South Korea 18 years ago I met Patrick he was over there and he was uh, very different from me he was he brought a lot of different things to the table when I talked about my ideas about coming to uh, Central America and opening a hostel I was thinking more Costa Rica, and he was like thinking about investments and stuff like that, and he was thinking Panama. So we talked about it, and the last couple of years, we saved up a bunch of money and came over here and uh, found this piece of property in, in the middle of the, the forest reserve. It's like the deepest uh, private property in the park. So like, I really loved the property, and he was like, wanted to still keep looking, but I was like, well, either way, I'm going to do it. And then he was like, sweet, okay, well, <laughs> I'm in. So then <clears throat> we started like with the permits and everything like that and, and architectural plans and it took about four years to get all the permitting done. Those were tough times, you know, like, so you're up against some obstacles and especially when you're in the park, it's like, you've got all these like bylaws, like as if you're like building in a city where you can't have a rooster next to your neighbor here. It's like, you can't cut a tree, you know, you have to like get permits for everything and, and uh, which is great because you're kind of responsible for a part of the park and, uh, also, the, the town relies heavily on unemployment from tourism. So that's part of like ecotourism right there is actually giving back. It's not necessarily like how much you recycle. It's like also the sustainable uh, development within a community and uh, having a positive uh, contribution from both sides. Yeah, because you're from Canada, is that right? Yeah, I'm from uh, Vancouver Island, Victoria. And my business partner, Patrick, he's from uh, Edmonton. 
Yeah, because I guess the local people might see, you know, two foreign guys coming in, making money in our country. But like you said, if you're working with the locals to benefit them, do you feel that you've been well received by them or did you meet some resistance? Oh, I think at the beginning you meet three kinds of uh people people like when you're coming in to do a project like this the people that are helpful and want to contribute and benefit from it then the people that just don't care and then the people that get jealous so but i think that there's more people that want to like contribute and like see the success than the people that don't that are jealous and and then the people that don't care just like go on their daily life which is is awesome because then uh it stays an authentic area which isn't overrun by tourism <laughs> I mean, you've, everybody's seen the effect of that. Mm. So there's, there's pluses and uh, minuses to, of course, to, to tourism. And you offer jobs to local people as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. We like, kind of pride ourselves on being the biggest uh, employer of the local community, even bigger than the biggest hydroelectric company, Enel, which is the dam that you cross between uh, here and Bocas del Toro. They employ from, like, different cities, and but we employ directly from the village. Thank you, Andy. Interesting story. Yeah, two foreign guys setting up this business there and creating this really special place. We also got the chance to speak to this lovely lady. My name is Ayla Patel, and I am general manager at the Lost and Found Hostel. And we wanted to ask her what it is that she thinks makes this hostel so unique. Well, I guess you could definitely say, like, unique within Panama is the location and the fact that it takes a little bit more effort to get here than most places. Even some of the places in Panama that are more remote, uh, I'd say that there's just a slightly like easier access, you know, um, to get to them, whether it's like a provided transportation. While it's here uh, already, knowing that you're going to have a 20 minute hike to get up the hill, it's creating some mystery. I can remember at least when I first got here, I had no idea what to expect. And I definitely had my breath taken away when I came down the stairs for the first time. So I think just the unique location and the fact that you have to put a little bit extra effort in to get here makes it really special. And what can a traveler do here? Like, What do you offer your guests? We offer quite a lot of different activities, a lot of things on and around the property. So there's plenty of hiking trails. There's also activities that you can do for free, just on your own. So you can go to these river canyons or the waterfall, which are not too far away. There is the treasure hunt in the forest, as well as one around the hostel. And then we also have organized tours. So you could definitely fill up, you know, two or three whole days with all of the do-it-yourself stuff. And then for the organized tours, those are more centered around like authentic experiences with Panamanians from the area. So there's a coffee and wine tour, and then there's also a horseback riding tour. So both very like authentic, organized experiences. And then in addition to that, I mean, there's just the social atmosphere, you know, family dinners and hanging out in the bar. There's a whole kind of different hostel at night. One more thing that does make this hostel different is you have a pet. So can you explain who Rocky is? Yes. So, okay. So Rocky is a kinkajou, so also known as a honey bear, and he's a nocturnal animal. Rocky was poached at a very young age, so by a local family closer to the Boquete area. And uh, he was meant to be kept as a pet, uh, which is very unfortunate, obviously. And Patrick and Andrew, the owners, had found out about him and they had already done some rehabilitation and release programs up here. So that's why we actually have, there's another cage on the property that's empty. I don't know if you saw that, but that was used um, at the time for rehabilitation and release. But then when they got, when they ended up getting Rocky, he had already been castrated. And so they made the decision to, uh, to keep him here. So yeah, he's been with the hostel for, I want to say it's got to be about... 11 years now and we think that he's about you know probably turning 13 this year so he was about a year and a half old when they got him yeah so he's a nocturnal very active at night he really likes interaction and being spoken to that's a, that's a lot of fun and he's just a really curious little animal as well mm-hmm. so but you know as he gets older he also has become a little bit more grumpy too that's normal but I think that I mean, of course, you never really want to see an animal in a cage like that, or at least you don't really want to think about it. But in Rocky's case, I'd say that I think he's in like a really nice environment, or at least the closest thing to his... This is his natural environment, you know? So besides the constraints of the walls, that is like his personal space because he can't actually mark his territory. So like having that enclosed space makes him feel a bit more comfortable, and then he's just got everything else around him that is pretty much home. How long do you 
expect him to keep living I ask that question because people might be listening now and they might want to come in the next year or two to see him so how long do you think he should be around Hope- oh, hopefully I think that Rocky's going to inherit the hostel I think that Rocky mm-hmm. yeah I think that most likely Rocky will probably live for at least uh, another 15 years I think that that's a pretty reasonable estimate but it could be a lot longer than that I think the maximum recorded lifespan of a kinkajou in captivity was like 40 years or something like that I might not be right on that stat but I know that it was a very long time uh, and so he could possibly outlive the owners so we'll see yeah. <laughs> finally can you explain that you guys have quite a good deal here if someone books three nights what do they get okay so if somebody books three nights they get the fourth night free yeah so that's just a nice promotion people just end up getting to do more with their time and I mean we don't like people feeling rushed sometimes we have people that book one night to come here and it's such a shame Because they come and almost unanimously they wish they could stay longer. And they've either already made a reservation somewhere else or they just don't have the time in their travels. But being able to stay here for a good amount of time, there's just so much to do. You don't have to feel rushed and it makes it a little bit cheaper on the budget. Thanks to Isla, the manager of Lost and Found there, for talking to us. And as Isla said, the Lost and Found hostel actually offer a coffee tour. Okay, guys. (laughs) Good morning. Welcome to Margarita Farm. My name is Jonah. He is the crazy man in here. <laughs> the name is Kune. Kune is the owner of this farm. Kune have for you on the table the Geisha coffee. This is the more expensive coffee now on the planet. Two weeks ago, one company from Japan, Shasha Coffee, paid $1,029 for one pound. Wow. Yeah. And now, this coffee is the regular coffee you drank in Lost and Found. But in here, you can put a little sugar and white cheese. White cheese? White cheese. Queso. Yes, si. oh. mm-hmm. This is very traditional in here in Panama. Okay. For the breakfast, for everybody. When you finish the drink the coffee, the big cup, you can eat the white cheese. Okay. Uh, uh, put it yeah. in, yeah. drink, yeah. and then eat it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, what? What was that? You can eat the white cheese. Did sound like he said you can eat white shit. <laughs> Doesn't it? But no, what was he actually saying? white cheese but white it sounded cheese. like white shit <laughs> if you go on this tour they're not going to expect you to eat shit don't worry but have you ever heard of putting cheese in your coffee before but actually it was pretty good that is really weird because well i don't drink coffee myself but i just can't understand how those two flavors would go yeah i can't really explain it but it did go quite well and he did say that it's something that they do it's not even that particular coffee it's something that they do do in panama But it did blow me away with all the facts on how, you know, was it a pound of coffee went for over a thousand dollars? What? Yeah, most expensive coffee in the world. Yeah, I just, you think what kind of people are paying for that? But that is amazing. So old uh, Kuna there, he, he's laughing, isn't he? Because he's got this lovely farm, lives in the mountains, got this really nice house and he produces the most expensive coffee in the world. And it's a beautiful little tour. So what happens is they pick you up from the Lost and Found hostel. And once you've done their little 20-minute hike back down to where the cars can get to, get on the back of their truck. And, yeah, you're sitting in their garden for the day. And they give you their fruits, their coffee. You do a tour around the garden as well. It's massive. Well, it's like a farm. And he's got the cutest little dog as well, which, I mean, is brilliant. Uh, it was a really nice dog. We're, he's like explaining the coffee, but everyone's getting distracted because they just wanted to like stroke the dog. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It wasn't just coffee. It was more than that. It was other things that he makes and grows there. He makes his own wine as well. So it really was a nice day. Yeah. And we actually, we made, we roasted our own coffee beans and made our own coffee, which was interesting because I've never seen that side of it before. Oh, what drink were, it, were they make? I know it was the sugar cane drink with the l- lime. You don't really like sugar cane juice, but with a bit of lime, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Well, mainly because lime is like my favorite fruit at the moment i'm not a massive fan of sugar cane but so i was kind of a bit worried when i was trying it but it was honestly so delicious and i just drank it straight down (laughs) standard Sounds a a bit like a game earlier do you need the spit bucket again obviously not (laughs) that was funnier than any of your clips hey i like my innuendos all right let's wrap up lost and found uh i'll just mention the bar again because every night they have a happy hour which for panama because panama's a bit more expensive than you know the rest of south and central america it was like one us dollar for a beer which is pretty good 
and there's normally games going on. We played the most like rude, disgusting game of Jenga I've, oh, yeah. I've ever experienced in my life. Like, Jenga was so good. So every uh, block of wood that you pull out of the Jenga has a number on it, and then they have a sheet of paper with dares. And, you know, there's things on there from... Fake Pretend, an orgasm. Yeah, fake an orgasm. And then others where you have to like run around naked around the bar, yeah. around the outside of the bar. Uh, but it was really fun. And like, yeah, it, and we just had such a good group of people. With the beer pong, we also played a new game called Tummies, which Tummies. is like my new favourite thing. <laughs> hey! Flip, flip, flip. Right. It's really hard to explain. I mean, if we're ever travelling together, you and I, I will show you the game because it's amazing. It's kind of a mix of beer pong and... I don't know, actually. But you have to kind of use your chest to bounce the ball into cups and then... If you get it in, then the other team has to then do flippy cup. Yeah, so it's a mix of flippy cup and beer pong. Oh, it's just great. Yes. It's and so good. Right at the end, you have to double bounce the ball into the cup in the middle. It's intense. Every time you played, it was a really close game. And you've got like two teams, four on each team. It's just hectic and mad. But I've, I've never seen so many drunk people concentrate that much before. Yeah, really, really good fun. So at day and night, it was very good. Thanks to all you guys out there who recommended that we stay there. Yeah, we really, really loved it. And we would definitely recommend that you go there. Leg of the trip, Bacchus del Toro, mouth of mouth of bull or mouth of the bull? Just bull's mouth. Bull's mouth. That's right. Well, that's another innuendo. So it is. Yeah, we've got loads in this episode. It's full. Amy, explain what is bull's mouth. Okay, so this was like a bit of a longer journey. We got there with three to four hours. Uh, you get the bus there or like a colectivo and then you have to get the boat across to the main island which is called Bocas del Toro and then from there you can go and stay on other islands like we did. We stayed on Bastimentos because well we heard the best about that island and it seemed more of our vibe. Apparently it was one mainly for couples and a more of a relaxing local island so yeah a lot of the local people live there. Now that I've stayed there I would say stay on Bocas del Toro yeah the main isn't the other name for it Cologne I think Cologne the, yeah the Cologne island. but I That's think it. it's easier isn't it yeah it's just a much better place to stay in terms of food because they're islands and you know they have to kind of import the food and all of that it is more expensive than the rest of Panama and hey Panama is not a cheap country if you're talking about the rest of Central America or if you're coming from South America the price does go up but I mean it's not as much as Costa Rica for example yeah um but yeah it's so Boca del Toro is just a cluster of islands it's like an archipelago and you can get boat taxis from one to the other but yeah I would recommend staying on Bocas del Toro it's known for being a party place and my perception of it is that maybe five to ten years ago it was a really big party place and now it's just kind of got old and it's a bit run down and it's just a bit like Everybody does Filthy Friday, which is kind of a pub crawl, but done by boats. But it's really expensive. How much was the ticket? Yeah, I think we were looking at like, is it 30 or 40 US dollars each? Maybe more, actually. But they say, oh, but, you know, with that price, you get entry to places, you get some free shots, you get a free T-shirt. We would have rather got a ticket for it without all that free stuff that comes with it and just a ticket be a bit cheaper to experience it. So we, in the end, we decided not to go for it, Filthy Friday, although we were there at the same time when it was on. We just did our own little pub crawl around the main island with some friends that we actually met at the Lost and Found Hostel because it's such a family there. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, but effectively, I think that was expensive because effectively you're just getting boat taxis to three different hostels which we could have done by ourselves because the boat taxis were like between one and two pounds sometimes 50p so I don't know I just feel like it was expensive for what it was and the people that we knew went on it didn't like it it just seemed like 
a very kind of outdated thing that worked years ago, but they haven't changed it. And it just seemed like quite grubby and dirty. Yeah. So I'm just being honest, guys, you know, like some of you listening may have gone to this and absolutely loved it. But this was the impression that we got. If I were to do Panama again, I wouldn't go to Bocas del Toro because we did San Blas and everybody said San Blas is just out of this world beautiful, which is correct. It's unbelievable Caribbean islands. So if you go to Bocas del Toro, it's kind of a poor man's San Blas and it adds in all that party element. And even the people on our San Blas tour who are massive party people didn't like this pub crawl. So I just don't really think it's yeah. that great. I agree. And where we stayed on Bastimentos Island, so because we had to get a water taxi to the main island, then another one to our island, the money we saved by booking a cheaper hostel on Bastimentos, we then ended up spending more money because we had to get another taxi to get there. But once we were on the island, we were told there was like three different beach options. One is free, but you have to trek half an hour, 40 minutes it like through a pretty muddy, disgusting path, which we did. It's not even a path, I would say. Yeah, which we did, and we had a good, a good day on the beach, but by far the best beach we've ever been to. And there's two other beaches. One's a really famous one, uh, but then you have to pay for a water taxi to get there because you can't walk there. And once you arrive, you then have to pay five US dollars each to get on the beach. And we were just thinking, man, this place is draining our funds big time. And then there was another beach, which is Starfish Beach. It sounds really cool because apparently there's just a load of starfish. But then again, when we were talking to people, they were like, yeah, there were a few, but there wasn't that many. But that one, it costs like $40 for your day round trip to get there. You have to like get a bus and then a boat and then you pay to get on the beach and then you have to do the bus and boat back. So it ends up being $40 before you've eaten food or anything just to go to the beach and it's just it's a very expensive place you have to pay to get on almost every beach and I don't think it's worth it it's like I say it's run down and I don't think anything there is like that nice yeah it's it's not very nice it's not classy but sometimes that's fine if you just want to go there and party then I'd say yeah if that's your thing do filthy Friday stay in a hostel on the main island Cologne Island which is has access to water and just stay there and just relax, go to the bar, have drinks and do the Filthy Friday pub crawl. If that's your thing, then yeah, go for it. But I think your average typical like traveller, especially as a couple, it is different. I think your average traveller, you won't be blown away by it. No. And if you're moving through Central America, you'll go there anyway because it's just before the border with Costa Rica. So you'll go there, but max two, three days. I don't think you need any more. I agree, but the coolest thing about this place was Mr. Jaguar. Oh, Mr. Jaguar. <laughs> so this has got to be the, the coolest name of an interviewee, is that the phrase? Interviewee on this podcast ever, Mr. Jaguar. My name is Arnulfo Archibald. I'm the owner of Hostel El Jaguar. Yeah, so while we were on Bastimentos, because it is really close to the main islands, but it's actually very separate in culture, we heard such a big mix of languages on that island. So we were asking Mr. Jaguar... What is the language here? Normal, uh, when we're small, we begin to speak. Uh, we grow English at home with we mother. And after we go to school, we start the Spanish. Sometimes uh, speaking, we grow English in the community. We call it Wari Wari. Okay, because when we're walking around the streets here, we can hear people, and when they say things, we can hear a little English, we can hear a little Spanish, and there's something else mixed together. Could you just, could you give us a sentence, say something you'd say to your friend? Just give you an example. Bastimento uh, community, we have Bocas community, and uh, we have Almiranta community. And all of we are like descended from Jamaica, Bluefield, Nicaragua, San Andres, Colombia. But even between us, we speak the Guariguari, even different. Oh, wow. Because if I go to the shop and I want to buy an egg, I say, an egg. Mm-hmm. But the Creole people from Almirante, they go and say, I want a egg. A, a egg with an H. Yes. You say you're going to the cemetery, we're going to the burying ground. Okay. And they want Almirante would say, we're going to the burial ground. You will say, I'm going to a party. And then we just uh, eliminate that word party. And we put it the Spanish word, fiesta. Mm-hmm. We're going to a fiesta. And things like that make the little difference. And it's the same English what you all speak. And we speak, but when we speak between, we always speak more ordinary. 
um, so fast sometimes, then it's really difficult for you to understand us. <laughs> but the same English what I'm speaking with you. Correct. Or more or less. So to me, this part of Panama feels like a different country to the rest of Panama. Do you think that's yes, fair? Yes, because we in the Caribbean. You can find dark people in Cocle, in Nigeria, Panama, with South Haiti, but they don't speak we Creole English. They don't speak Spanish. Who come in the Caribbean normally speak this worry worry. And many people come when they was making the Panama Canal, they have some what just speak Spanish alone, they have another mm-hmm. group that speak English. So in Panama is big, but if you go in section of Panama like Rio Bajo, San Joaquin, and there's those places where you have many dark people, then you can get some um, Creole English, I even better English and we all won because many of them were on the Panama Canal. Coolest voice ever, like coolest guy. I didn't really care what he was saying as long as we could <laughs> record him and get that accent on the podcast. So as you can hear, you know, suddenly we're in the Caribbean. We're not in Central or like, you know, Latin America anymore. We're in the Caribbean. It's very, yeah, like like he was saying, very Jamaican or, you know, places like that. So it's another example of how you can be on a bus for a few hours in Panama and you feel like you're in a different country. Yeah, but like as he was saying, the language is a mix of English and Spanish and then kind of... Guadi guadi. Guadi guadi, like indigenous language. And I'm just reiterating that in case any of you, maybe English is your second language and you couldn't fully understand what he was saying because it was difficult for us as well. But like, I just love his accent. He sounds so cool. But yeah, thank you, Mr. Jaguar. All right, moving on. We've got one, but a very interesting observation because this is it now. That was our Panama trip. We're at the end. Amy, what is your the one thing you took away from this, uh, you know, very diverse and rich in culture and rich in history? What did you take from this place? Yeah, well, if you haven't heard the show before, a fobservation is an observation from us. What the fo? Fobservation. And I would say it's just kind of little things that we pick up on a trip that I think is worth mentioning. And I found it really strange with their toilet paper, okay? It's just one sheet. <laughs> you know where you get <laughs> toilet paper? It's, it's two sheets doubled up, you know, to protect your fingers. <laughs> or hands that, that's sounding weird use wet wipes mate yeah it's one sheet so you have to like pull a lot off double quadruple it up before you can use it oh, I just I just thought it was a bit weird watch out if you go to Panama watch out for the one sheet and also I just want to give a little shout out to Melanie Haynes one of our patrons oh, because Melanie. we have done a lot of promotion for wet wipes recently due to the toilet part of our long term episode and I agree with her um, she actually gave up using wet wipes a few years ago, whether that's for her face or, you know, I don't <laughs> she know. She didn't specify. She didn't specify. I think it's one of those plastics that you don't really think about. It's a one-use plastic, guys. Yeah. So as much as Nick is promoting it, I want to be anti-promotion here and say, actually, the planet is more important than your bottom. <laughs> and you should, if you feel that dirty, you need to get in the shower and use water. Oh okay? yeah, I'd love to. That's the first option. It's just when it's not an option. But you're right. Uh, wet wipes are bad for the planet. I've actually Googled this since. There are plastic free wet wipes out there. Travel is obviously, they're not available in shops. But once we're back home and we're more in charge of what we are consuming, then I completely agree. Plastic free wet wipes are the way forward. Definitely. So thanks for pointing that out, Melanie. All right, that is the end. It is the end, which means it's time to mark the country out of 10. Now, the way we do this is in three categories, culture, price and nature. So, Nick, what would you give Panama for culture out of 10? I think culture has to be high, actually, just because of everything we spoke about. It's such a big mix. I was very surprised and impressed by it. So I'm going to say 8 out of 10 for culture. You know, not my favourite ever. It's not an India, it's not a Brazil, but it's quite special. Yeah, I'm going to go for 7 out of 10. Um, but within that, I am including the San Blas Islands. Like we said, it's going to be our next episode. But we've got a lot of culture on those with the Kuna people, the autonomous Kuna people. And yeah, like, you know, even spending the day on the farms in Lost and Found Hostel and meeting all those local people, learning about their coffee and yeah, all of it. Yeah, I'd, I'd give it a strong 7 out of 10. Price. Price for me will be lower not the worst ever yeah. for sure but i'm gonna give it a six out of ten because it's still it's not bad but i think that part of the world like central and south america i think it's got to be cheaper than what it is so six out of ten for price i agree six out of ten because 
you know, where we're staying now in Mexico, we're in a massive bedroom right now for 14 pounds a night for both of us. And we both get the best breakfast we've had on the entire trip. So, you know, and I appreciate different countries have different economies and you can't base it in between, but value for money, it is an expensive country. And especially in Central America, it's an expensive country. So, you know, yeah, six out of 10. Yeah, Panama and Costa Rica, they've, well, I don't know what they can do about it, but yeah, their accommodation and food is too expensive in my opinion. But nature, I mean, if we're including sandblast in this, which we have to because it is part of Panama, and Bocas del Toro looks cool, all the islands, you've got mountains. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, Bocas del Toro. But if we're including sandblast, which I think we should, I think nature's got to be 10 out of 10. Wow, 10 out of 10. If, really? Yeah, because sandblast, you'll hear next episode. Wow. Blew my mind. Okay, well, I'm going to give it my highest mark today, but I'm going to give it an 8.5. Because, yes, sandblast, but also the mountains. Like, some of the sunsets and the mountains and, like, the way the clouds were coming across in its own microclimate in Lost and Found, absolutely love that. I'm definitely becoming a mountain girl since we've, tra- like, long-term travelled. Yeah, so I love that. Yeah, it is a beautiful place. And, obviously, if you think about geography, it's next door to Costa Rica. So everybody knows Costa Rica to be this massive, you know, eco country with all these amazing animals and stuff it's just next door so the geography of it and you know it has rainforest it's not that different so yeah i'd give it a strong 8.5 out of 10 and you get the atlantic and pacific ocean you got the caribbean yeah no i think it's uh, i think it's well impressive for nature so there we go we were very surprised by this little country it packs a punch and it's definitely a very backpacker friendly place to go no doubt there's stuff for backpackers to do all over the country great place to pass through but also a great place just to visit you know just to see panama itself and also if you're wondering about other places in panama there's so much information online because i do believe there's a couple of places that other people went that we missed Bukeki? Bukeki? Uh, boquete boquete yes yeah which we didn't go to because we, I think we heard that Lost and Found was a bit similar. We were a little short on time at that point, so we missed it out. But there's tons of information about that online, so make sure you go check that out as well. So what's next on What The Faux Travel podcast? In two weeks' time, we will be doing our mini episode, and that's all about Sandblast, as we said. Get in touch if you've been to Panama, and if you want to go, anything, get in touch with us if there's any more questions that you have. And of course, ways you can support us and keep us going is through Patreon. You do get rewards back for your money. And we also sell merchandise that really helps us to keep going. And if you can just, if you haven't already, because I know a lot of people have, if you can give us a nice iTunes review, can you give Spotify reviews? I don't know. Whatever platform you listen on, that would be really helpful. Thanks for listening, guys. And thanks for your continued support. Don't forget, you can get in touch with the show. You can email us at whatthefoepodcast at gmail.com. We are also on all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we are also on Patreon. For more information on all those things, you can go to our website at www.whatthefoetravelpodcast.com.